I have here with me Faisal Al-Matar, the founder of Ideas Beyond Borders. Uh, next to him is Yvette Alberding Tame. She is the executive director of a group called Witness. And then Gillian Caldwell, who's the CEO of Global Witness. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here. Um, so this is a moment of peril for journalists and for people doing journalistic work. Uh, and this is a really interesting group of people before you because I'm here in my capacity as a journalist, uh, but these three people are all doing journalistic work without being strictly sort of in the realm of, of traditional or, or legacy media. Um, and so we really want to sort of probe what that means, what's at stake, uh, especially for people who believe in the importance of speaking truth to power, uh, you know, holding, uh, holding accountable uh, public officials or anyone who's engaged in corruption, tracking extremism. Um, these are heavy topics and at a moment where there is a lot at stake globally. So I think we'll start with Faisal. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I wanted to talk first a little bit about um, something that you've thought deeply about, which is how propaganda spreads, especially online in this moment um, where we have the democratization of publishing and these massive platforms like YouTube and Facebook. Um, and maybe you can speak to some of the complexity of how we ought to think about dealing with propaganda material um, and why it's not so straightforward as just trying to sort of remove it from the internet, for example. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so this is my first time in Aspen. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I mean, if there is one defining character of my life is that I live most of my life under propaganda. I grew up under Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq, and then after the, the, the second war, the second Gulf War, then we start having opening up to the, to, to the media. And, and, and with that, most of the media is also getting politicized, and many of them start being run by political parties or militias and or extremist groups. So, I mean, so, so the, the first element of, of growing up was that we had mainly three main, major channels. One is the Iraq television, which always praises Saddam Hussein. He's the greatest man on earth. And then the other one was run by his son, Odeya Saddam Hussein. And it was like playing kind of Western music and Western movies, but they kind of censor some of the things. And then sometimes they use it as a propaganda against the United States. So to give you an example, uh, one of the movies is American Beauty by Kevin Spacey. And uh, they edited some of the parts. So, and then when we went to school the second day, and they were like, this is exactly how Americans live. They, they sleep with their daughters, they sleep with their mothers. Um, I mean, they might be right a bit about Kevin Spacey, I don't know about that, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but they, they definitely were using lots of the Western content, especially the ones that were critical of the United States as, as a mean to propaganda, that this is, even though it might be a drama movie, but they actually use it as a tool to say this is, how, this is our enemy and everything. And then the, the third one is, is mostly kind of the foreign uh, television um, that they try to broadcast to other parts of the Arab world, and also in the, and what's what was really interesting is that I mean when, when we live in a close society like Iraq at the time, is that I mean it's so you have state-run television and it's all really at the core it's based on agenda against the United States against the, against the the West etc. To the ways that for example like for somebody like me who grew up there, actually didn't know that we invaded Kuwait. Uh, like the power of propaganda and the power that we were taught every day on, in the schools as well as in the education system, so that in the media was like we have been invaded by 33 countries and, uh, and Saddam Hussein and the power of the Lord and the power of the strongest army in the world were able to defeat all that coalition. And actually, even today, like when, when, I, when the second war happened in which we started having more open media, or at least to some extent compared to Saddam, I was like, actually, one of the people who, was, who were shocked was like, we invaded Kuwait? What? What, what Kuwait? What? We lost the war. We thought we won the, the first war and the, second, the one with Iran and everything. Like, imagine like, being fed constantly propaganda by the regime. And then what, what was really interesting that happened afterwards is that, so the war happened and now we started having more open access to media and, and also access to the internet. Um, then many of the other, other televisions start popping up. And... They, and they all happen to play a major role of a political agenda. There, there's hardly, they, they all, so they're like you have a media channel run by Party X, a media channel funded by Party X. And all of them start, all of the, all of the news are getting more and more politicized and it played a major role in actually the civil war that eventually emerged after the, the chaotic, chaotic war that happened in Iraq. So 
what happens is that most most people are unable to actually like to find any find of acu source of accurate media because it's really all propaganda wise and what happened is that as a result many of us uh, i mean I'm, i was born in 1991 so I'm, I'm kind of from the millennial uh, internet age and we start looking for social media actually as a source for figuring out the truth, because now we, people are start posting, okay, there's a suicide attack here, it's done by this militia, don't listen to the TV, and start becoming a place for many of us who are looking for accurate information. But then the backlash, backlash that happened is that these same social media sources became places for extremist, extremist recruitment. So now Facebook and YouTube and, and many of the sources that we consider as kind of alternative media, not the mainstream, not the one that have offices and established, are become places in which they talk to you about identity and why they need you need to f fight for jihad and and all of that. So like, and they utilize the same kind of keywords that those of us who are looking for truth start using the same keywords to actually start using it for recruitment and try to get people to join meetups and try to get people to be involved in the civil war um, at, at the time that that still exists today. So and with that, there was and I would like to talk about like some kind of. Like a paradox happened, uh, I was witnessing, and now with my organization, the SBR Borders, which is focusing on counter extremism, counter extremist propaganda, is that it's really a double edged sword in dealing with that content. Is that on one hand, if you censor that content, if you try to take it away from the internet, they actually start utilizing that as also a recruitment tool. They say, oh, look at us, we're under war by Facebook and the Zionists and the 1%. And they try to utilize kind of the same propaganda tools, sometimes even extremists. Uh, groups here in the States utilize. So if you censor them, if you allow them to talk, then they will use, still use that the same platforms as a recruitment center. So there's kind of a paradox over here. There's, I think there's hardly a win-win situation in dealing with the, the propaganda and the sources there. And what's your sense of, I'll use YouTube as an example, um, of how, how platforms are sort of grappling with the complexity of these questions? I mean, are they, are they grappling with them at all? Yes, they are. I mean, I, I'm very familiar. My, my, my uh, dear friend, Yasmini Green, she's the head of research and development at Google, or what's called Jigsaw, Google Ideas, uh, which is focused, uh, I mean, after, I think, 2015, they had a request from President Obama to try to make YouTube le become less of a place for recruitment. And, I mean, they, they strike that, and, I mean, I, I've kind of helped her a bit, but so uh, is that they kind of try to strike a line between extremism and violent extremism. So generally what they try to do, they design some of their algorithms and machine learning to actually stop mostly the violent extremist elements. Um, and what, I mean, what they, and also they had a uh, program called the Redirect Method, which is that they created playlists of, uh, of content that can drive people away from the authorization. So if somebody says, oh, I want to join ISIS and uses like Google search words or YouTube search words, and then what happens is that they're going to have suggestions or advertising that is done targeted towards those people who are prone to radicalization to actually stir them away. Um, I, I cannot give the statistics of how successful that is because she's a, the expert. But me personally, I don't think that is enough, um, is that because, I mean, the line between extremism and violent extremism, in my opinion, is very gray. And sometimes people can be extremists today, and just by simple uh, propaganda, they can immediately move to violent extremists. As we have seen many uh, groups within the uh, Middle East, is you have the Muslim Brotherhood, sometime within a like, few weeks, they, they eventually join Al-Qaeda. I mean, the leader of Al-Qaeda at the time, Ayman al-Dawahari, used to form a Muslim Brotherhood, which is an Islamist but supposedly nonviolent organization. So I think the, 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 the line that Google struck, and I think some of the Facebook as well as some of the social media companies struck, is, I think is, a, is not the accurate one. I think they should focus on extremism in general. Well, and especially, I think, like using machine learning, for example, to make decisions that we think of as being, as you say, there's a gray line and, and sort of editorial in nature. Um, there are many complexities that come with that as well. Yvette, I wanted to go to you on platforms as well. What's your sense of how platforms should be thinking about their responsibility in this realm? Yeah, thank you. Um, so at Witness, um, we support people who turn to video and technology to protect and defend human rights, who tell their stories. So today, that can be an 11-year-old girl whose house is being raided by ICE agents with heavy weapons, who is documenting what's going on in her backyard. Or it could be uh, a woman in a favela who sees a policeman 
kill a six-year-old child in her street and documents it. And now she's actually capturing very important evidence of police violence. But it could also be somebody who lives in Aleppo and who sees a barrel bomb fall on their neighbor's house and is starting to document basically atrocities in the Syrian conflict. So in that context, we've been working for years with uh, very brave people in Syria who have been documenting. They may be citizen journalists, journalists, citizens, people who have captured uh, the conflict. There's more hours of video of the conflict than there are actually hours in the conflict itself. And there's a fantastic organization called the Syrian Archive who we helped collect and preserve these mostly citizen media of atrocities. Um, what they've put together an archive that has 1.2 million pieces of video in it. Uh, many other people started YouTube channels, uh, not just because they wanted their stories to be heard, but also they needed this to be evidence for future accountability for the victims of these crimes. Then last year, YouTube introduced a machine learning algorithm to stop exactly what Faisal is talking about, um, to, you know, to extremist and terrorist content. But in the process, they deleted hundreds of thousands of these videos that people actually had um, sometimes lost their lives for and had gathered. So, so deleting videos that weren't examples yeah. of extremism. Because the algorithm the, doesn't see the difference between an ISIS video and a video that can actually um, create accountability for mass atrocities. And so we worked with uh, YouTube to... to help restore uh, a lot of the videos. But the scary bit is we don't even know what we're not seeing. And what we're seeing on the other side in criminal justice is people are starting to use these social media videos. Like the first arrest warrant has gone out against a Libyan uh, rebel who very proudly posted a lot of his executions on social media. So for the first time in criminal justice, that's actually being used to hold people accountable. So it's really important evidence. Yeah. And at the same time, there's this sort of interesting dynamic where the same technology that's enabling people to, you know, be capturing video and uploading it to the internet and hold people accountable, as you say, um, the, this sort of access to publishing or sharing people's stories or, or bearing witness um, is happening at the same time where there's, there's this sort of increased hostility toward people doing this kind of work. Yeah. Um, and I wonder about the relationship between those two things um, and maybe the ine inevitability of it and then, of course, the question of yeah. what we can do to protect people trying to do this work. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, it's this sort of the age-old saying: you can use a hammer to bash somebody's head in, or you can build a house, right? Like, and I, I think that um, we see that many people obviously are turning to social media, but we're also seeing that, for example, ICE is using profiles that people post on social media on Facebook to arrest and deport people. Um, so a lot of the guidance that we do is like how to use Facebook in an, in an era of mass deportations. Uh, how do you keep yourself safe while you're actually using social media? So I think a lot of it has to do with sort of a literacy, like trying to understand how to use social media. I do think that as there's a huge clampdown, not just in America, but around the world on protests, on people who are standing up against regimes, People are going to the cyber streets. Uh, it's, there's a distributed networks of activism, but it's really important to try to figure out how to do that in a safe way. If you're an LGBT person and you have used a, a gay dating app in Egypt, your fingerprint may be enough to track you down and they'll link your Facebook account to everything else and they'll arrest you. So, so we have to think through what these technologies mean and and think about solutions that can actually keep people safe. Yeah. I wanted to go to you, Gillian, next. Um, I know this is something you've thought deeply about uh, in, in terms of sort of the crackdown, the broad and arguably global crackdown against uh, people who are, are sort of engaging as citizens and trying to just sort of uh, you know, live out their basic right, human rights. Um, what's your sense of, of how do we even begin to think about how to, because the scale of both information and misinformation and, and sort of the, uh, the gravity of the situation we find ourselves in, these are just huge problems. So what are, what's the sort of right framework for us to begin to unpack, um, you know, protecting citizens doing their work as citizens and journalists? Well, I guess to, to speak to the global context for a minute, um, I, I'm the CEO of an organization called Global Witness, no relationship to, although deeply aligned in terms of values with Witness. 
And we're, we're sort of like a global detective agency focused on the corruption, human rights abuse, and environmental degradation all too often associated with the worldwide trade and natural resources. And you know what, what we see, because we work at a global level, uh, you know, not just our teams, but alongside a broad range of locally based organizations who are trying to um, ensure justice and sustainability in terms of how the natural resources that surround them are being used, is that um, we're really confronting quite a, quite a worrisome global crackdown on civil society today. Um, the uh, Civicus, which is a global coalition of NGOs, actually uh, has a monitor, and they have um, determined that only 3% of the world's populations live in fully open societies today. Um, and the vast majority of the really restricted spaces are in the Americas and Africa and the Mekong. But even here in the United States, we're starting to see reductions uh, in our civil liberties. And uh, this wouldn't be considered under their criteria a fully open terrain. Um, and this is worrisome on a number of levels. I mean, what I'm talking about here are restrictions on freedom of speech, on freedom of assembly, on the freedom of non-governmental organizations to uh, register or to receive foreign funds, uh, on the implementation of new laws, new terrorist laws, which can be used to target um, opponents of governments or the business deals governments are striking with corporations are all too often charged with terrorism, uh, for example, or you know they're, they, they're confronting all sorts of character assassination. Um, and this is worrisome because in the context of global media, uh, which is really in a fight for its life in terms of how it continues to sustain itself, I mean, newsrooms all over the world are shrinking. They're increasingly relying on citizen journalists and uh, non-governmental organizations like ourselves who are, are also understood to be journalists, although we're at the same time um, trying to you know, advance systems changing solutions to the problems we find. So if we're living in a world where the opportunity of citizens to, to talk about what's happening and to document the problems and to propose solutions is as restricted as it is, um, we're really in a very grave situation. We do an annual report on the killings of so-called earth and land rights defenders every year, and our next one will come out in July. But since we started documenting those killings uh, in 2012, we've seen a steady increase in the number of killings. In fact, four times as many earth and land rights defenders around the world are killed as, uh, as our journalists. And as we all know, journalism is an increasingly dangerous profession. Um, but I, I don't think all is lost um, in the sense that, take for example, um, crackdowns that surround um, advocates really pushing for better environmental regulation and a fairer uh, distribution of wealth around natural resource extraction. Um, the primary source of those conflict is a lack of free prior and informed consent, which is mandated under international law. These are people who are entitled under law to be consulted regarding how their land is used and when it's used and why. And it's the lack of that consultation that's leading to these sort of death-defying conflicts. Um, so I think you know, for, for all of us who are involved here as investors, as uh, business leaders, and inside government, there's just an enormous role to play to ensure better due diligence in terms of how these global supply chains are operating, better environmental standards, better social standards, and better governance standards. Um, and it really, I know here in the United States, I, mean, I live in London at the moment, but it's impossible on some level to take your eye off the ball here in this country because there's so much uh, that's, that's challenging that's happening, that's challenging underlying values. But at the same time, this has global repercussions. And I think a lot of the acts of the current government have created a sort of an anything goes environment in countries all over the world. And if we don't step up as civil society, as business leaders, and as, as consumers to demand something different, um, you know, we'll really be challenged to ensure truth prevails. One of the things that I've been thinking about and people in my industry are thinking about fairly obsessively, I would say, is um, this 
decline of, of trust in, in legacy journalistic institutions um, and what to do about it. And I wonder, because the three of you are focused on truth telling that expands beyond just the traditional realms of magazines or newspapers or websites, um, how do you see this decline of, of trust in journalism and other democracy supporting institutions uh, affecting or, or having a ripple effect in other realms of truth telling? I mean, is it, is it damaging that uh, newspaper journalists are you know, being undermined by the President of the United States, for example. Um, how, what are you seeing in your, in your areas um, with regard to this decline in trust? I, I mean, personally, I think it's, it's, it's damaging on the long run because, um, I mean, any form of lack of editorial board uh, allows for any form of information to flow without any checks and balances, in a way. Um, and it gets more difficult when, when you go to close, more closed societies in which it's really hard to know what is the truth in the first place. I mean, if somebody comes in right now from North Korea, let's say, one of the most repressive regimes in the world, and says, this is how life is in North Korea. I walked on dead bodies. I saw dragons, uh, all of that. Um, it's hard to actually know to verify that information. So what, what becomes more difficult is that when, when there's more of the alternative medium with, with lack of editorial board, it just allows all the stories to emerge without any form of, of, of checking. And, and I mean, also what case happens a lot in Syria, what happens a lot in Iraq, is that there are so many stories flourish, like coming up, and it's really hard to know which one is true, which one is false. And what, what, what extremists use and what propagandists use is try to, even if the story is false, they try to make it as emotionally appealing as possible to the way it gets thousands and thousands of shares. I mean, when I, when I, when I grew up in the Civil War, middle of the Civil War in, in, in Baghdad, and m many of these like alternative or social media, including the, the politicized media, were utilizing so many stories as like, oh, today a, a Sunni militants came into our neighborhood and killed 20 Shias. Actually, most likely, sometimes these stories are false, but then they show pictures that they did from stock images of dead ba babies, or, and then they're like, oh, we have to fight back. And then suddenly now the, 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 the post is going viral, and then people are getting agitated, and then many of these extremists uh, propaganda tools, they also have a call to action, just like any all nonprofit organizations do in a way. In a way. And they utilize, like, they utilize their story and then they put a call to action and next day you have a m thousand men because of that fake story are now trying to kill the other side. Uh, I mean, the closest I've got, I think, in the United States was the Pizzagate story, um, which I think was also used in so social media and no editorial board. And wasn't there was a guy came with a gun to the pizzeria? Yeah, it was a, a conspiracy, for those who don't know the reference, a conspiracy theory that spread online on, among fringe groups and eventually led to an individual taking it upon himself to uh, show up in a a really charming pizza parlor in Northwest Washington, D.C. Um, with a weapon. And thankfully, no one was hurt. Um, but it's a sort of a salient example of how this misinformation online can, you know, result in in real w world threats and action. Yeah, so multiply the pizza gate with a, with my million, and you get the Middle East right now. With with most of the people really don't know uh, what's going on and and what they believe in and everything. Yeah. Well, and I want to go back to content verification or sort of how we can figure out what's real in a moment. But before that, I'm curious to hear from, from you specifically, Faisal, and, and from anyone about um, how propaganda is different in a, in a media, eco media ecosystem where, as you lived it in your childhood, you had only two television channels, maybe, um, versus today where propaganda spreads in this, this media environment where there's a, a total saturation of information, both true and false, and it's just like informational chaos. Um, w what differences do you see there? I mean, generally, like when, when we do our work, and I mean, uh, one of my most depressing hats of our war was like I, I sit for hundreds of hours analyzing ISIS material and how they how they are effective. Uh, thanks for alcohol; it helped a lot in dealing with that situation. But um, is that I mean, one of one of the main main one of the main cords of of, of extremist propaganda is that they try to reach. The person, obviously, they are appealing mostly to emotional appeals. They're not trying to utilize reason or logic or any terms of fact checking. And they utilize any kind of content that they've seen of like Assad bombing or, or, an, or, or any, any related material related to like bombing or losing of civilians. And then they try to touch on things that I think are very important, touch on identity and purpose. 
and and uh, that's when the propaganda is t directed towards Middle East, uh, Middle East and all this. But they shift that propaganda. When the, one of the uh, to, when it comes to Western Europeans is that one of the uh, great videos. Uh, I don't want to use the word great, but I'm using it metaphorically here. Is that they're trying to reach out to Belgian Moroccans and 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 and, and Belgium is considered one of the biggest exporters of ISIS in Europe. Uh, there are probably more Belgian. Belgian ISIS members joined ISIS, then Moroccans who joined ISIS. And they try to utilize, they're like, OK, you are Belgian. This is, what Bel Bel this is how Belgians look like. This is a racist video of a far right guy telling a Moroccan you should go home or something like this. You're never going to be Belgian. Just believe me. It, it, come, look at this brotherhood. Look how most of us look alike, kind of speak the same language. We're, we're part of a, a war between good and evil. Um, and for a 20-year-old, 21-year-old Moroccan who is living in in, in, in Belgium or sometimes in France, listening to this and then to some extent can, I mean, it's obviously half truth because many of these citizens have better rights than most, than even Moroccan citizens in Morocco, but they try to tap into this identity, a, a purpose. We're gonna give you a part of, of, of being a global warfare of, of good and evil. We're gonna restore all of, uh, all of the, the glories of religion that you belong to, to what used to be. Um, so this is like generally, I mean, it's super effective and appealing because it's hard to say no to this. I mean, they're obviously based on half truths, but many, many of these young people, and, and we have very targeted content in which uh, they can appeal to these young people belonging and purpose, and now they're part of kind of a video game. Sometimes some of the ISIS material that I've analyzed actually looks like a Call of Duty style video games that they put in a video and then they add some content and some amazing, I mean, I wanted to show actually ISIS recruitment video, but I, but I, but I think the FBI will not, will not let me do this, but um, is that I mean, one of the most important things, like they show a video of Saladin, he's one of the most well-known figures and, and he's one of who liberated Jerusalem. And they, then they show, look, look when, when Saladin was in power, look how united we were as, as Muslims. We were able to liberate Jerusalem, and now look at the people in Palestine, how they're suffering, et cetera, et cetera. Look how us as Arabs, we used to conquer almost half the planet, and now we're asking for refugee status, and we're escaping on boats. This is the, this, let's, go back, like, let's go back to good, good old dignity that we used to have, et cetera, et cetera. This is super appealing, and, and that's how they are able to, were able to recruit tens of thousands of people. Well, and I think important, too, to point out that it's not just the people making these, these propaganda videos who um, are adept at sort of tapping into emotion or tribalism, but also the platforms that reward emotional response and validate sort of partisan behaviors as a way to get retweets or um, a certain kind of Facebook engagement or uh, I'm, you know, YouTube audience or whatever it may be. Um, and so I wonder how, how you both think about, um, you know, I mean, one core question is how do you make truth and speaking truth to power more compelling than propaganda? Yeah, th that's a really good question. I, um, so a couple of notes. First, go back to what you call the legacy media. <laughs> um, I, we think of media as an ecosystem, right? So there may be the person who's a citizen who captures something. There may be the media activist who has a Facebook page who collects it. There are amazing collectives now who verify in ways that are unprecedented. They're using like Bellingcat, who does open source verification. So, so there's sort of the claim to fame that was with the legacy media that you can trust something. There are actually amazing people who are doing this incredibly well. But I think the legacy media has a key role to play. So um, when they are telling stories, whose stories are they actually going to tell? Um, if you go into the Syrian archive that has a chemical weapons database, are you looking at that information as a trusted source of information? And to me, that really has a lot to do with narrative. So a lot of the communities we work with in the US uh, are, are incredibly brilliant at counter narrative to our philosophy is that the more people can tell their own story, to change the story, to, you have to change who actually tells it, right? And so it's not just counter narrative, but it's really strong narratives of the truths that are coming from the people whose truths, they are living these truths. But I think that then the legacy media can actually amplify that. And then the second thing I would say is that um, we did a project here that was called Capturing Hate where we actually looked at perpetrator and bystander videos of people who were filming abuse against transgender and gender non-conforming people, people beating up people. And uh, we looked at only 300 videos that were online in, on the platforms, um, mostly on YouTube. 
And those were watched 90 million times by the time we actually looked at them. And they were accompanied with, with comments that said things like, they are an it, you have to kill them, go out there, kill more people. So to me, um, the platforms do have a key responsibility, right? So the content policies, how are you, because YouTube has a policy that says they will actually not tolerate hate speech. So a lot of the work we do is bringing very practical case studies back to them and thinking about all this content that Faisal is also talking about and, and the perpetrator content and the bystander content and flipping it. So what we did with our project is we turned it into a tool for LGBT organizations so they could use it. So it, it was turned into data. And I think that's the same. We're also doing a project looking at perpetrator videos in, in the Middle East that would be great to talk about. But like, so I think you can look at that as information. It's visual information. It needs to be verified. And then how do you flip it and turn it into something that can be used for good? Go ahead, Gillian. Well, I just think you know the, the same opportunity that the online world presents us, which is to be, you know, for, for every one of us to be broadcasters and to reach untold billions, um, you know, with, with what compellingly told stories, uh, you know, is the fundamental threat, in fact, to freedom of speech because, you know, these platforms have monetized uh, us and the, and the things we believe in and the products we purchase. I mean, that's their financial model. So in the efforts to create a fully customized experience, that is gonna resonate with us in terms of the ads it's serving up or the responses to our searches on Google, it's creating these ever more restrictive universes in which we're really only hearing from and speaking to people who agree with us. And that's, that's fundamentally problematic on so many levels because uh, you know, I, I do believe that we, the, the answer to these problems cannot be to squelch speech that we disagree with. Um, you know, it, it is a crime to incite violence, and that crime should be, you know, prosecuted. But it isn't a crime to be racist, in fact, um, and to spew racist and bigoted uh, commentary on the internet. And I think we really have to be clear about what those distinctions are, because we don't know who is going to be uh, in our judicial system. We don't know who is going to be our elected representatives at any given point in time. And we don't know who's going to be making the decisions about what speech is appropriate and what speech isn't in the future. So you know, I think there is a, there's a much tougher conversation to be had. And I don't feel the government's engaged enough in this conversation. I think there's been too much onus on companies that have a financial disincentive to address these kinds of problems. And I do think we need to be um, having a much more robust conversation about how we really create a world in which the truth is free and freely accessible. I mean, the death of net neutrality is another example of uh, you know highly problematic example. I mean, it you know basically, if you have more money and more power, your ideas are going to reach uh, pe people further and faster um, than you know than if you're disenfranchised, and that's that's fundamentally problematic. Well, so I think we all on this stage agree that platforms have some kind of responsibility for the material or information or misinformation that uh, appears on their, on their platforms. Um, my question for you is how do individuals hold them accountable, especially as you say, if government you doesn't seem to understand the, the sort of what these platforms are doing um, and, and isn't really seriously engaging with the, the how profound of a, a sort of shift in the informational environment this is. Yeah, I think one of the things that we experience a lot, we're overwhelmed with requests from groups. For example, if you are a group uh, in, the, in Burma, in Myanmar, you have been flagging very, very um, troubling content that directly asks for violence. Uh, and so describe a little bit more what you mean, just in so case So for example, it will say, um, kill all the Muslims, uh, they are dogs, don't even... Uh, spare their children, and that post will be up for at least a year. There are very, very good civil society groups, and they actually are flagging that content. So there's something broken in that system. The other thing that's much more mundane that we deal with all the time is people are saying to us, my account has disappeared, and I don't know why. That happens in America too, by the way, not only in the global south. So one of the first things platforms should be doing is simply being extremely clear and very transparent about 
What are you taking down? Why are you taking it down? And if you then said a no to Stuart Syrian or to somebody who's been documenting police violence in Brooklyn, explain that, make a simple notice. The, the amount of conversations we have with people who said, we got a notice from Facebook we don't understand. Or people, maybe there was a Palestinian group that had 300 videos and two of them were problematic and their entire account was taken down. So I think that's a very, very important first step is literally just transparency. Um, in a more extreme case, uh, with the Rohingya crisis, a lot of people were actually documenting the violence, uh, the ethnic cleansing on WhatsApp. And we've seen, because we're helping groups uh, collect this really important evidence, we've seen videos disappear because the content strategies, uh, the, the content um, uh, policies of WhatsApp are extremely opaque. So they may delete your video in three months, maybe in six months, so there may be somebody sitting in Silicon Valley who just says, oh, this sounds like a good policy, and is actually deleting content that's really hugely, vitally important. I, th I think in terms of the question around individuals and what we can do, I mean, you know, as a campaigner, you know, I think we were probably uh, confronted with the most powerful opportunity we've ever had in terms of reshaping how Facebook thinks about doing its work. I mean, Facebook has been on the coals. I mean, with Zuckerberg testifying before Congress, um, you know, with the uh, amount of outrage that's been generated by virtue of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the Russian interference in the election. I mean, it, were I organizing around that, I would be creating a really potent and powerful list of people's demands, taking a look at the policies as they stand and re-articulating those in a way that makes real sense and driving you know, a massive consumer campaign rather than deleting your Facebook account. Why don't you get active in terms of reshaping that ecosystem so it's a force for good, as it often is and can be. Um, but I'm not seeing that, and I think part of the problem is that this is really tricky terrain. It is very complicated, and nobody has the answers. But I'm also not seeing the forum for creating that conversation outside the context of an environment in which, as I said, you have economic incentives to do things that may be deleterious. I want to go to questions soon. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to ask, in terms of calls for transparency, to, uh, uh, like in terms of asking these platforms to be more transparent about, for example, why they might take down um, a video or a photograph or, or leave another one up, um, I also wonder about how difficult it is to get real transparency when we don't know why the algorithm decides what it does. Because so often it's not someone sitting in Silicon Valley opting to remove the video, but it's an algorithm. And we also don't know why the algorithm surfaces certain information to certain individuals and not others. And I don't even think the platforms no, frankly. And so how do you unravel this sort of the mystery of the algorithm, the biases of the algorithm, and expect to get good information on the other side? I, I just want to, I mean, um, I mean, I've been bad multiple times from Facebook for, for ridiculous reasons. But, but one, of, one of the things that, that I've actually learned, uh, which I think that all of, all of us should be familiar with, is just understand kind of the basics of how these algorithms work. And, and they generally work on how many things that you like and kind of the po viewpoints that you like. And then you're going to be fed most of that information. So as an individual, as an individual citizen, is that I try to like things that I don't like, actually. So like I, I try to look at for sources. That, for example, I'm not a big fan of Al Jazeera, but I try to put likes on some of their posts because I don't want to be living in an echo chamber. So until today, I still actually get uh, news coming from Al Jazeera because I want to don't want to live in echo chamber. But sometimes, like whatever I actually dislike as as a, from a personal uh, political viewpoint, I try to like the people who hate me or like like the people who post things that I don't like. So in that way, I keep my news feed to actually have a very diverse set of views. So that's I think every individual. Um, can can kind of play a role in, in 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 kind of making sure that their newsfeed does not become an echo chamber and get the only sources that these, because the whole system is based on advertising, so they try to get as many things as you like as possible, so they can sell you ads. It's actually like I like when Mark Zuckerberg was doing this the the Senate thing. It's like how do you make money? Ads. As simple as that. That's how they gather data, and they. And I think that um, for I mean, uh, 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 and what I always get, I always get banned. Is like they mostly look for some some keywords that I've utilized until eventually, actually, Facebook invited me to the headquarters to discuss that. And because I get under mass reporting as a blogger and as a writer, there are so many people who try to mass report me to actually shut me down. And then 
the, I think that what Facebook needs to do more on a more uh, level is that they try to create verified activist accounts so they can know if somebody who's uploading that video is actually doing it for activist purposes or he's an extremist, and that way they can verify his information, who that person is, etc. They can stay in touch with him versus fake accounts spreading uh, information all over. Do you have concerns about platforms deciding who's valid? Well, I mean, I mean, they are they are private companies at the end, and then they get to decide whether they they want this user or that user. So that I take it from more of a, the free market libertarian stance. There, you seemed like you had something. Where to start? <laughs> um, now, I was talking to a thirteen-year-old the other day, and, and wondering why, if I listen to John Legend, I get all this like really commercial music in my feed. But anyway, um, she just rolled her eyes at me and said, you really didn't train the algorithm, did you? And I, I think there's something really to that, and I think the same is true for the, for the big content companies. I'm not that optimistic. I know they're profit-making private enterprises. But I also think that the more case studies we can bring to them, like two-step deletion, where you preserve certain content that's tagged a certain way, um, certified activist accounts, I think we who use these platforms need to back up our content to places that is not owned, is not profit motivated. So that's how we train a lot of people that they get keep copies somewhere. Uh, and I, I do think that, um, for example, turning off your facial recognition, there's actually a lot you can actually do. We have lots of tips and guidance and things for anyone who wants to see it. But um, you do have to, we live in a very complex world. We are doing a lot of work on AI and visual media right now. I don't even know whether that's a synthetic piece of media, whether the person is actually the person. Is it a real person who's inciting violence? Is it, you know? So I think we just have to be incredibly smart and collaborate with good technology companies. There are some of the technology companies that are quite open. Facebook, not so right now. I mean, they're, but they're, so like really getting ahead of that, working together with developers. Um, we do a lot of that. And I think that's the only way we're going to solve it. Well, and let's talk about synthetic media for a moment, and then we will go to questions. Um, I guess my question about, and when I say synthetic media, for those who may not know the term, um, this is like a, a video that's made to look like it's Barack Obama speaking, but it's not. Um, so there are, and the interesting thing about this technology is it's developed by computer scientists who want, um, when you're in a, a, an area trying to do a conference call and you don't have good reception, that you can still get a clear picture. So it's, you know, the intentions behind so much of these things are good, but the potential for misuse is profound. Um, and so my question about, about fake or synthetic videos is how much worse is it going to get in terms of um, people questioning what's real? When we enter, um, you know, I think we're actually quite close to a point in which these videos are, are really convincing to the average person, if not already there. Uh, and so what happens to a shared sense of reality, if we even still have one, um, when these are everywhere online? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I, we recently did a little convening in Palo Alto, but we brought together also commercial companies and academics and things to really think about that, right? Um, I think we're going to get flooded with a lot of content that's going to be extremely difficult to see. But then somebody said, you know, when we started using currencies, we were like, oh my god, how can I trust that that bill is real? And somehow we worked through it. I'm not saying that the world we're in is not a hell of a lot more complex right now, but Adobe is already working on some technology that actually can see whether a video is spliced or so. But what's really key is that you know the NGO world and the commercial world are starting to really work together and and counter this like counter facial recognition. How do you protect yourself? The, and like the MIT Media Lab is doing some great work on that. So so I'm a cautiously optimistic, but I'm also really concerned about um, what this in the meantime this kind of hate speech is going to actually cause before we can stop it. I think we should go to the audience, but I think there's an there's a there, the upside to this is that um, you know we would hope for uh, a world in which people were really scrutinizing of what they're being told, they're scrutinizing of their news, they're scrutinizing of um, the perspectives that are being brought to them, and if we can use this to leverage a really important conversation around how you find your way to the truth, your truth, and the objective truth in terms of facts and circumstances. We'll be in a much better situation, and uh, you know we're past a world in which you, you can you can rightfully say a picture's worth a thousand words because a picture may have been manufactured, and I think youth today understand that um, because they are so digital native that they're perfectly capable of generating synthetic media. Uh, yes. Do you think there should be laws against fake news? 
What and, do you mean when you say fake news? Well, it's not a term that I use. L- l- synthetic, uh, what you're talking about. D- like misinformation. You're talking about. I mean, as an American, I have uh, pretty profound free freedom of the press concerns about any sort of law that would um, prevent people from exercising their right to free press and free speech. So I think that's really difficult. Um, I don't know if one of my uh, colleagues here with more global perspective could speak to how it this is being a um, well. I mean, I think elsewhere. you know one of the the key tools we have is is defamation law. So you know uh, it, it, we're publishers, and defamation or libel claims are one of the most significant legal threats we face, and that means we have to be a hundred percent diligent about the allegations that we're making um, and make sure those are properly substantiated. Um, so I think you know where you're disparaging uh, you know a person or a business or their character act or activity. Um, you know, we do have built-in infrastructure to to respond to that. I think beyond that, uh, it's it's pretty difficult to think about how you'd legislate it. Yeah, I mean, I second I second both. Uh, I mean, if you put regulations, also who regulates the regulator, right? And how do you know that this regulator is not biased to make sure that he can use that laws to censor dissidents or critics critics of the regime? I mean, we have now example like Turkey after the latest. Um, Code d'etat, which I think uh, like has been utilized a lot by the regime to crack down on civil society, journalists, academics, uh, and and in some countries, for example, Saudi Arabia, they even consider people who are atheists to be terrorists, uh, and that's the law that they, they have now in Saudi Arabia. So I'm very afraid of very like strong le- legislation against kind of fake news and misinformation. But as I mean, libel. I mean, one of my friends, uh, Majid Nawaz, who's a former former extremist and and was put on the list by the SPLC, uh, and he won a defamation case, 3.4 million against them. Um, and uh, because they said that he, like they intentionally, in the report, they intentionally misquoted him. They they took some fake quotes from suspicious sources who really just hate him, and then they said he wants to do this, and he wants to do that, et cetera, et cetera. And then he hired a big law firm in, I think, California, and then he sued the SPLC, and now the president of the SPLC issued an apology for him, and also $3.4 million. So th- if the laws, and as long as we have these laws to protect from from libel, uh, and, and I think it, well, we're going to are in a good place. Other questions? Here. I'm sorry, I really can't see you guys. Yeah, <laughs> here. Oh, I'm here. I can see you perfectly. Uh, I don't see you perfectly, but that's fine. All right. In any event, uh, we just had a situation a few months ago in our country where Mark Zuckerberg was called before Congress over the Cambridge Analytica scandal or whatever you want to call it. And he came out of it pretty unscathed. I mean, it seems as though uh, that there's no energy or desire on the part of Congress or anyone else to do the kinds of things that each of you seems to think is absolutely essential to at least make the situation better, if not get it under control. So, I mean, I asked this question last night to David Brooks. I mean, you know, with Butch Cassidy and Sundance, when you come out and you realize all of a sudden that there are a thousand guns pointed at you and you're probably not going to have the huge victory that you thought you might have, how do you prevail and proceed in this kind of environment? I can speak to this. Um, I mean, I think it's a huge challenge. I, um, I was part of a group of journalists who met with Mark Zuckerberg in April, and um, he was sort of describing what he wants Facebook to do to tackle misinformation and how important journalism is. And it became really clear to me in the course of that conversation that he doesn't understand journalism <laughs> and that he doesn't seem to really care about it. And that's actually understandable. He's not a journalist. He may be the world's most powerful publisher, but he won't acknowledge that he is. Um, and so I think you know there is a sort of cognitive dissonance and, a, a, frankly, sort of a gap in values, as you point out. So it, it is really difficult for journalists and people who are concerned with with truth telling and holding the powerful accountable to know where to go from here. I mean, I think you just kind of have to keep going in some ways. Um, but I think, from a as someone who leads a newsroom, I think you also have to think very seriously about um, journalistic institutions. Have to think very seriously about their relationships with these pa- platforms and and sort of what comes from them um, and whether it's good for the public. So that's something we're grappling with. 
I would actually add to that, I don't think the lawmakers really understand either, so it was a really perfect combination <laughs> of people in the room. But I, I think, um, you know, I was recently in a meetings with a lot of people from the Global South. India is the biggest Facebook user. In Burma, the Facebook is the internet. There are 39 million users. And they're basically saying, we are the users. We're the next billion users. So I don't think this is going to happen overnight, but I do think the users are going to vote about which platform they actually want to use. And again, you may call me way too optimistic, but I actually think there's so many people who, are, who can actually either leave that platform or they can use it and press for better. If they really need it, in many countries, that's the only thing you have. Press for better. They, they were basically saying, dear Mark, it was originally called dear Mark, this coalition, but then they decided they didn't want to call it after him. But uh, I think they're going to be quite powerful. So I, I, and he wrote an email from his personal email account saying, oh, but I'm hiring moderators in, in Burma. And they were like, yeah, you hired like 20 people who really basically are aligned with the bad side. So you really don't know what you're talking about. And they're basically, I mean, but I think they're going to be powerful. They're, that's a, a lot of people. So hopefully that will put pressure as well. May I do one thing? I think that there has been a recent development, I don't know if you have noticed it, on both YouTube and Facebook, is that when you see like a video by Russia Today, at the bottom of it, it says this video is paid for partially by the Russian government. And you can actually see like some of the like channels uh, that uh, sometimes, for example, I, for example, I didn't know that In The Now, which is kind of a video production, very nice videos that are also actually part of Russia Today. So, so now both Google, they are doing this at the bottom of the YouTube video, if, if you see propaganda video. And also on Facebook, now when you see advertisement, it tells you who is actually, this is paid for by whom. So for example, like you see an ad about guns or something like that, you say this, this ad is paid for like the whatever the NRA or something like that. I think that this this these are I think very kind of I mean they're baby steps, uh, but I think that will be necessary in, in the future to actually know where these sources are coming from. I mean, uh, to Gillian in just a moment. I think that's a very very baby step only because how much of the information that is posted to these platforms is being disclosed to the platforms as either paid or unpaid, whatever it is. Um, and, and I'm also curious about whether those disclaimers appear globally or just to people in certain regions. So, Gillian. Well, yeah, but there's also the complication that um, you know anonymous companies are still legal and routinely registered here in the United States, and you don't know who the beneficial owner of those companies are. That's why we have a global campaign to end anonymous companies. We've got the entire European Union to agree, as well as the British Overseas Territories. But um, you know, now that our Supreme Court has decided companies have free speech and money is a form of speech, you can incorporate whatever you like and hide behind. Um, you know, hide behind the name, and you know your 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 advertisement may not at all be uh, just. It may be Americans for Gun Safety rather than the NRA that appears to have promoted your ad, and you and you have no idea of knowing who's at the bottom of it. Exactly. Other questions? I'm going to trust the mic runners to tell me if anyone. <laughs> No other questions. All right, I don't think. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the panelists. This is great. Thank you all.